today the uh, speaker uh, for the TSVP talk uh, is uh, Dr. Meraf Stern. Yeah. So uh, welcome to OIST. And then uh, Meraf uh, did her PhD at the uh, Hebrew University. And she worked on the Cerebellum uh, with uh, Professor Yosef Yarom. And she also uh, uh, worked uh, with uh, uh, Professor Larry Abbott uh, at the uh, Columbia University uh, regarding uh, uh, chaos uh, in uh, uh, random neural networks. And then, then she uh, took a uh, uh, research position at the Schwarz Center at the University of Washington and uh, currently uh, researcher at the Hebrew University and also affiliated with the uh, uh, University uh, of uh, Oregon. And uh, today uh, she's going to talk about modeling networks uh, reviews, how neural connectivity transforms spatial time. Oh, but I forgot to tell you. So uh, she was uh, also uh, a tutor for OCNC uh, from uh, 2016 to 18. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for your help uh, for us. Yeah. Okay. So then, Meraf, please start your lecture. So thank you for the introduction. So as you said, uh, for me, it's just great to be here again. And it's a great honor to be part of the theoretical sciences uh, visiting program. Really, I, I knew before I'm coming that there, there are amazing, amazing scientists here. So it's really a great pleasure. And uh, a special thanks is to Jonas and Hoka, who really worked extremely hard to bring us here uh, in one piece, despite all the difficulties. Um, so yeah, let me start with the talk. It came out a bit ambitious. And I, yeah, you cannot hear me? OK, uh, so um, I hope I can uh, cover uh, what I've put in. But at the same time, I would like to be understood. So please feel uh, comfortable asking questions uh, during the talk. I know what's in the talk. So <laughs> if something is not clear, please ask. Um, and so as I would like to start the talk, right? there's a lot of clutter in my head, and lots of thoughts are running in them. And there is a big mess. I don't know about your heads, but uh, our brains are a bit messy. And um, they're, they're a very complex system. I think one of the um, most complex questions of our time is to answer how do they work. Now, they're complex at every possible level. So if we look at the brains and what they're constructive of, um, you know, you start with molecules and proteins. There's enormous amount of them, and they interact with each other. And making sense out of it is difficult, but it's not enough, right? There, the molecules and the proteins they build and they fill the neurons, the basic cells, and the neurons themselves interact. And if you kind of get the hunt of it, you can see what's coming, which is well, neurons um, by themselves create local networks. Uh, these local networks um, have uh, activity and they interact with each other. Together, these local secrets they build. Uh, these brain areas and somehow from all this clutter of things, um, cognitive functions rise. So as these babies learn to uh, sit, uh, walk and eat, they also learn to interact and talk and laugh and we do all kind, sorts of things. And so there is a big question hanging here of how do we even approach that? Before we even phrase a specific question, what, what approaches can we take to make sense out of this big Ladder of things. And so I can think of a few ways to do that. And I think people take all these different ways. One of them is to tweak something small, you know, the deficiency of a protein of some sort, and see how it affects our ability to talk, walk, and so on. One of the cognitive functions that we do. Um, it's a great approach to kind of jump over all the intermediate uh, levels but it doesn't give a mechanistic understanding of how things interact and how things are building up. Um, it's possible, but it's, um, I think, very challenging using this approach to build a full um, a mechanism understanding. So what other people are doing is to look at relationships. For example, how um, presynaptic neuron affect postsynaptic neurons, right? How they interact and, and um, <laughs> talk to each other so they remain on the same level and you get a mechanistic understanding. And, but that is lacking the ability to kind of get the bigger picture here. And so again, it's, it's a great approach. Um, but what I try to do 
is really um, get a mechanistic understanding and get an idea of how the bigger picture looks like. So what are the principles, you know, that I can make sense of all the clutter and, and, and move on to the next level. So eventually I can explain cognitive function. And so, um, you know, the hope is that we can do it at every level and move on. And of course we can keep searching within the same level, uh, all the details and keep correcting, but we can kind of get one step up every time. Uh, and um, just to kind of give you an example from the non-neuroscience world. So this will be something very uh, uh, hopefully understandable, the idea at least, the principle, um, maybe the philosophical principle behind this approach is to give uh, examples from non-neuroscience, which I think are very obvious to all of us. For example, magnets, right? They have strengths, we all know what magnets are, um, but they become magnets because there are so many electrons running around them and they have a spin. And so in order to tell you how a magnet works, I don't need to explain to you all the different electrons running inside. Um, however, because we understand how these electrons running inside and how they interact and all the energy that they have in the spin system and the fact that the spin is uh, very is non-zero, then you know, we understand uh, the idea of magnets, which is kind of the bigger picture. Uh, and there's another example, which I just couldn't resist in Okinawa, which is the heat. You know, there are plenty of air molecules running around us, different heights, and they hit our bodies, right? And that's why we feel heat. And so I don't need to <laughs> start describing all the different molecules hitting my body right now. I can tell you it's hot. And uh, here I can also tell you, you know, they interact with air and uh, therefore it's humid. So I have one number or two numbers in this particular case uh, for, you know, making sense out of this, uh, uh, um, many, many, many particles. And this is the idea when we look at uh, neurons and go into the network uh, activity. Uh, I think Linoy was here. Maybe she has mentioned similar things because uh, she, use, she uses uh, somewhat the same family approach approaches that I do. And so before we move on, uh, another example from neuroscience, which would also kind of give us a build up for what I do. And this is the very famous Hodgkin and Hodgkin Huxley model um, that uh, really is doing the same thing, right? What they did was to look at the average activity of many um, channels that and explain how neurons change their voltage. So just super, super quickly, you know, neurons uh, have this ability to hold the voltage difference between their inside and the outside. Uh, they do it by having, you know, these holes in their membrane, <laughs> these channels, uh, and they control the ions coming in and out. Um, there are about there are millions of channels in every neuron, but instead of modeling every single channel and how ions coming in and out of every channel, what they did was to look at the probability of channel working being open and when it's closed, so stop working in that sense, and um, and pull out the average of them and how they impact the average of other channel type. And so they were able to explain what the neurons do, which is to fire or to spike, uh, which is to raise their voltage suddenly. So they took out all these humongous mass of channels, look at the average and gave us the picture at the neuronal level rather than at the molecule and the protein level, right? So that's an idea of how to look at the mean. And so I will use the idea of neuron spiking and, and how they interact with each other to move to the next level. Right, so neurons, they, they create connections, synapses, and once they spike, uh, they send signals um, to the neurons downstream, the postsynaptic neuron, um, and we need to connect them, right, to build a network, right? How do they, which neuron is connected to, to what, kind of to move, to be able to move to the next level? Uh, I come from a cerebellum lab, so I have to say there are also gap junctions uh, we'll put them aside for this particular moment, uh, but it's just another way for the neurons to interaction. Actually, for this talk, it doesn't matter. Too, well, it doesn't matter too much. You need to tweak a little bit the models, but um, there is a presynaptic and a postsynaptic neurons. They interact, and we want to understand the network level of things. Um, all right. So um, to do that, like I said, we have to understand how they are connected. 
And now there's a whole different uh, set of stories opening up because in order to understand network activity, we have to understand how the network is organized. And there are diverse different ways uh, for networks to be connected. Um, many of them have, have been studied here. And this is just one example of clustering. Um, Marilka uh, did a very um, hard uh, work of, of uh, finding morphologies of neurons in the um, inferior olive. And what she found, and together with a huge bunch of people working on this very hard, um, that neurons tend to clutter together. So they form a cluster and they have, if these are the neuron bodies uh, in black, then in blue, you see their dendrite trees and they kind of hug each other in a cluster of neurons. So clustering, which is you know, a few neurons strongly connected among them and relatively more weakly connected to the rest of the network is a very robust and common phenomena, not just in if you're olive, but really across the whole brain. And I will talk about the meaning of clustering from the dynamics point of view. Uh, another example, which is which was studied here, and I studied myself for a while, is the idea that uh, excitatory type of neurons and inhibitory type of neurons uh, come to balance each other exactly when they influence neurons downstream. Uh, so you see that in this uh, particular study, the inhibitory and excitatory um, currents into a neuron. Uh, exactly balance each other. And uh, this means that when we come to connect the network, we have to um, make sure that it's not, uh, the, the connections are, are uh, balancing each other. So this is a constraint on network connectivity. And uh, what I start with, and the last thing I mentioned here is uh, cell, type, cell type dependent connectivity, which we also see you know, across the brain. Uh, if cells belong to some particular subgroup here in red, then they have a better chance in the layer two or three of cortex, uh, they have a better chance of a different subset, different cells being connected to them just because they are related to this group. So there's a, the, the chance of being connected with other neurons depend on the subgroup of the neurons that, that this particular neuron belongs to. And there are also inhibitory neurons here that do not care about this. Um, kind of differentiation between the different groups. But the idea in general is that um, connectivity, the chances of connectivity, the strengths of connectivity can depend on, uh, a, on, a, on the type or just a set, a particular subset of neurons that a neuron belongs to. Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm talking about um, kind of the bigger picture. So preferred attachment is one example, right? And there you can have many uh, examples. It can be because the network is feed forward, for example. So neurons um, um, strongly connected to neuron downstream and so on. It can be because preferred attachment. It can be organize, organization of directions in um, in the visual cortex, for example, where neurons are more correlated, more connected because they're more correlated by activity. Many reasons. Um, I'm not going to talk about the reason, I'm going to talk about what it what it's causing. Uh, all right, so the talk is a bit ambitious. And uh, can you promise to tell me when I'm getting to the end? But there's a clock actually, so it will be good. Um, I would like to show you what cell type dependent uh, connectivity, um, how it influences the dynamics. And actually the example I'm bringing is actually from neurogenesis. Um, and uh, I'm gonna show you how clusters and um, I promised and I will, I will get to that for sure, uh, how clusters uh, change spatial um, characteristic into timing capabilities. And we think it's a very major, um, important uh, properties of clusterings. And, and the last thing I will show you hopefully is that uh, feedback inhibition actually is an antidote for the clustering because what it does is to take the timing and transform it into special, special properties. All right, so let's dive into the cell-dependent uh, case. 
Um, and the idea is, like I said, to look at a very general question. What the division into cell types um, uh, do to, uh, um, what does the division to cell types do to a network? And uh, it's not, I don't wanna uh, create any particular scenario. I really wanna look at the general phenomena of dividing networks into, into subgroups. Uh, to do that, I'll start with no subgroups. So typically in order to study networks, what we do is we write down the two-dimensional connectivity matrix. It's just a list of the connections between neurons. So I order all neurons here on the different columns and here all neurons are the different rows. And every small element here is the strength of a particular neuron driving being the presynaptic of some postsynaptic neuron. And I collect all these connections into a network, it can be sparse. It doesn't, sparsity does not change any of the results that I'm gonna show you. So it can be sparse or not. Um, and I, I list them here. Well, instead of writing numbers, which is very confusing, you know, instead of numbers, I use colors. So it's very obvious uh, the different st strengths. And um, um, since there, there, there is no, order in this network, you know, these are just random number drawn some, from some distribution. I know randomness kind of gets the uh, experimentalists, uh, you know, on their edge, but <laughs> this is just uh, to kind of mimic a network without knowing anything about it. Uh, and so uh, I mark this matrix as J and basically all it's written here is that I've taken these numbers from uh, some random Gaussian distribution, um, that's it. And I need a dynamics, so it's a, um, a bit on the mathematical size, but we, the mathematics would actually go, will go decreasing between the projects. So um, I need a dynamics. So basically this is says that my network, every unit in the network is driven by itself to stability. So basically counting for the leakage in, in a sense. And, and the rest of the network. So there is a contribution of all other units. This is the sum here by their activity. And the activity of each unit is some nonlinear function of the input that this unit is getting, right? So that's the idea of very basic idea of firing rates of neurons. They get some input and as a result, they increase their firing rate. And I'm gonna work with tangent hyperbolic so if there are mathematicians here, they should say, well, this is not exactly tangent hyperbolic, the zero should be here. And I say, well, I also don't care about the particular number. I wanna find, I will show you that I can extract the phenomena and this is what, um, uh, what's interesting as in this, in this project. And so um, if we have just a network, right? There's a connectivity matrix for everybody and there is um, one dynamics that kind of describe them all and um, taking these random networks of connection that I have. Uh, and what's, what's interesting about this, these networks it, and why it says uniform is that um, every single neuron in this network see exactly what another neuron see, right? Because if the network is big and I draw in connections from some randomness and there's, there's a humongous amount of neurons, um, the picture that I see around me, every single neuron is exactly the same. There's no difference where you are in the network. There's no difference between the neurons. Um, and this is a very important point for modeling these systems, uh, just like the electrons and the spins in the magnet. On average, every electron, on average, every neuron here see the same thing. And so actually we can replace the whole network with just um, uh, one input. And we can model every neuron with just one representative neuron. So I really need one equation dynamical equation for this type of networks. Uh, and what they found by uh, kind of thinking about it this way uh, uh, is of course, when, when you do this correctly, so, so when you have this one equation and you fit it to the uh, properties of the whole network, they, you should have the same uh, results. It should represent correctly the full network, the autocorrelation, the changes in time of the full network. What they found was very interesting if you connect the neurons strong enough, if your gain is strong enough, um, the network uh, stop decaying and become active. So here it is uh, activity of neurons across time. 
Um, and there's really one number for the whole network and that's the variance of the strengths of the connectivity. Basically, if the connectivity is strong enough, the network is gonna be active. If it's not, the network is gonna decay. And now comes the story of, of the cell types. What cell types do is to change this picture. Um, and so when you have cell types, the connectivity between two groups uh, now depends on the group. So in, in um, we modeled it as a change in the um, strength of connectivity, meaning the variance of the distribution that we pull the numbers from is different. So now every uh, picture that neurons see when, when this neuron is looking kind of at the network and the inputs actually depends which group the neurons belong to. But neurons of the same group would actually on average would see the same picture. And so now, instead of the unstructured uh, connectivity matrix, we have what we call block structure, right? So I order the neurons again, and I order them by the cell types, the subgroups that they belong to. And here there will be strong connections, here will be weak connections. Uh, and when we started working on these problems, it turned out that these matrices have properties that have not been figured out by the mathematical communities. And so we kind of got stuck at that point, but we continue thinking about the activity of these networks. And so if we have the equation for the dynamics, uh, now we need to write the equation such that um, every neuron has a sum of the groups coming in and every groups give uh, an input to that neuron with amount of strength that depend on these groups on this group. And actually now we cannot write a single equation for the whole network, but we rather need to write an equation for every cell type, for every subgroup of such, because every subgroup see on average the same, every neurons in subgroup see on average the same thing. And it turns out that this number of groups, here I have three different groups, right? Uh, this number of groups defined a new matrix of connectivity. And this new matrix of connectivity is the, impact of every group on average on another group on average. And this uh, new matrix has the, both the size of the group and the strength, right? The group is bigger, more, con more possibility for connections and more strengths of connections, uh, the bigger impact. And it turns out mathematically that this uh, reduced matrix that's very easy to deal with because just a number of groups, you have two, three, five, Rather than the original network, we have thousands and hundreds of thousands of entries. Um, this, this reduced matrix actually describes all the properties of the full matrix. And that was actually new for the mathematical communities. And we found it by thinking of the activity. And so um, the, the eigenvalue, which is a property of the reduced matrix, would define now what happens to the network, not the average gain, the average strength of the initial, uh, sorry, variance of the initial matrix. And whether this eigenvalue is bigger than one, the network uh, of the cell types would be chaotic. So the, what we learned from that is that uh, when you divide into cell types, it's not the average variance, the average gain that is now responsible, but whether a very complex, um, well, it's not very complex, but rather a different, uh, um, the average is, is not what's meaningful here anymore. It's rather a different property of the reduced matrix of the, of the structure of the groups. So we deviate from that and I will show you, if you're confused, I'll show you an example and I think that then it will be very clear. Uh, just to say that once we did that, we explained the, the properties of the, of the largest matrix and it's also a mathematical study, uh, but I'll go to the example. So if you're confused, that's okay. Here's a very specific example of why it matters that we have cell types. And these are neurogenesis. Neurogenesis are actually part of the olfactory systems. And these are very young neurons uh, kind of born and join the network where they're extremely hyperactive and very strongly connected initially when they are born. And so if you think of a network without them, this is the, you know, just the, the random network that we started with. But, uh, and here's all the connectivity of the network without these newborn neurons. But when you add them, you have these small groups, right? I just listed here and here, this represented newborn neurons that are very strongly connected, hyperactively uh, active in the network. 
So we moved from a connectivity matrix of such a you know, uniform structure to this block structure matrix with two groups. And so uh, because the having a cell type uh, structure is not equivalent to having non-cell types, um, you get the following phenomena, which is if you look at the network um, uh, without these new newborn neurons, and you give it some average strength of connectivity in the network in this example would decay. And uh, so it's not active. It doesn't have its own internal activity. If you add these newborns, the network uh, become, uh, you know, the, the block structure become such that uh, the network will be active. But what's really interesting is that if you take these synapses, strong synapses, and you just um, randomly spread them across the network, it would not be active. So the ability to, um, to, to divide the network into groups is that for the same amount of energy that the body put into creating synapses, neural connection, uh, the fact that you have groups is more efficient way to give a network a dynamical activity just because it's divided into groups because the mean of this, um, uh, of this, of this uh, matrix is not this is is not what's uh, caught, uh, defining its uh, fate, dynamical fate when you have groups. Sorry, uh, I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> so, newborn neurons initially do not have uh, any strong connections. So, what do you mean? So they, I think, at the phase of their two or third week, they do create them. And they're also hyperactive, that's for sure. And we want to, you want to model this hyperactive uh, activity, and the, they do create these strong connections. So, okay. um, so you are thinking some some period of yeah, time some period um, in time. And so, um, and also, if you think about them hyperactive, that's how you would model that in these type of models anyway. So it's it's a dual um, ways of viewing that. And um, yeah, so this is, uh, so that's the example I want to bring. Actually, after this study was completely done, very recently in Mizrahi Lab at the Hebrew University, they, they show that indeed the newborns are needed to be able to different, better differentiate between um, others. And they, uh, they do have a, a somewhat similar model there, um, more exact to development of newborns. But the idea is the same, where they uh, they increase the activity under the network and enabling the network to better differentiate uh, between odors, right? So this was after all we were done. Uh, it was shown, which is always very nice. Uh, the dream of uh, an interartition, really. Um, OK, so uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, in the current model, the each uh, cell type uh, have uh, uh, excitatory and infusion synapses randomly mixed. So right. if you assume uh, some cell type is uh, excitatory, some cell types are inhibitory, how does the picture change or say? say? Right, and so initially this was a, a challenging uh, mathematically, but in, in principle, you can do that by, um, uh, right, by shifting the, um, so it's possible to add that to the model and it would not change the bottom line results. Um, you can shift the activity um, um, function such that it will be almost always positive, right? There are a few words that use that. And then uh, you can use it for, for positive and negative. And then you'll have um, inhibitory neurons um, automatically by, by sending. Um... No, that's not true. Sorry. Um... So you need to shift the, the function, which would not change anything. We know that. That's one thing. And then you have positive firing rate um, with 99.9% .9 probability. And then you need to shift, shift the connectivity. You need to shift the connectivity the same way um, so that the Gaussian is 99.9% oh, .9 positive. Um, now it's a bit tricky because you get outliers in the eigenvalues. 
we send you to a different stories of how to balance them. And this is where the critical balance comes in. Um, and so you kind of have those few steps to be done, but the, 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 different, the dividing into block structure throughout this whole process would remain. And this division is what causing the, the eigenvalues, right? To be um, defined not by the average, but rather by the structure of the blocks. And, and this would remain despite of all the tweaks that you would do to include excitor and inhibitor in Iran. Uh, so it's a, it's a long road, but the bottom result would, would remain, would hold. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to get uh, an intuition for why this works. The second, you know, um, why a small uh, cluster of well-connected neurons with, is better than the spread one. And is it something to do with having a higher probability within the cluster of, I don't know, co-joint presynaptic neurons or something? What, uh, can you give yeah so you want uh, the intuition beyond yeah, beyond yeah, yeah. The result. why this works yeah. uh why why this is working um okay um it's a good question so i need to think about because i'm i'm used to um thinking of matrices and eigenvalues but why uh from an activity point of view this is true um let's see um yeah, you have actually the, I think the clusters case are going to highlight the same intuition where um, you have this small group being hyperactive. Um, it, keep, it keeps responding to the input it's, it's receiving in a very um, strong way, right? So every small input to uh, any element to any newborn neuron um, gets a very strong response, right? And so um, this keeps driving the network in a much more um, uh, strong, robust. Well, now there are few inputs, right? So one would, you know, may give it a pick, and the other one would send it, uh, would help it actually silence, and so on. And so they are changing their activity in a very strong way. And that kind of drives the network to keep being active. While if it's just a big pool of uh, neurons where some synapses are strong, they are more easily being canceled by, the, by either inhibitory, um, by the inhibitory, um, um, uh, current by the inhibitory synapses and currents coming in. So there's more balance in this particular case, the last one, where in the in the newborn case, there is less the balance, I would say, is more fragile. Right? So it's very easy to get them kind of keep going. And what they do is eventually stick the whole network with them because when they are not silent, the whole network keeps keeps going. Um, and we're actually going to see this in the clusters. The small clusters would do something similar to the network. These are small groups that are very sensitive, and so they keep, you know, like little kids. <laughs> They'll keep you awake. Uh, okay. And so, um, could, could I ask a question about this part? Yes. Um, so you were talking about how you can vary the connectivity, uh, connection probability, or introduce cell types to influence the ability to maintain uh, activity in the network. Yeah. And then at the at the end, you were talking about how there's this finding in the olfactory system that uh, it helps for function, you know, introducing these new granule cells. So I was wondering if your framework had anything to say about the the nature of the activity. So not rather than just having activity or no activity. Uh, yes, uh, we can say uh, things about uh, whether the activity is more or less correlated between groups or within a group, for example, and this sort of questions. Um, yes, I just didn't, you know, yes. Uh. Then to what extent uh, would be similarity or dissimilarity between what you are, 
like you're describing in here and something like a Erdos, uh, like random graph that we have. Like a, a, those are like a- the, yeah. These are random artist running networks that we change to include- Exactly, and then the, structures. apart from like a necessarily thinking about the clustering part of it, if you set constraint on the degree distribution, like for instance- uh, so, so I'm gonna talk about clustering right now. How about that? I, I didn't, I divided into groups, but these were not necessarily clusters. They have different connectivity probabilities, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily more connected inside. The neurogen, the, the neuro neurons are, but it's not the general must be. In the next case is a, is a sub case in the sense it, it's a, these are subgroups, but they're also, all of them are more strongly connected inside. So I'll talk about clusters. Sure, but uh, but uh, but I'm trying to say is like for instance in case of the or the uh, like a random graph or network, what you have is you have like this Poisson uh, distribution among the network. You're putting a constraint that in degree out degree should be certain type of constraint for them, like you know should be balanced or imbalanced, and the same level of uh, un until they get saturated, the same level of a uh, network flow to so to speak takes place in there. And those are not really related to the clustering. I mean, they, it may or may not happen. For instance, if they move toward like something like a, a small world network, there will be a certain level of clustering start happening, but it is not necessarily required for like those type of post, uh, post and distributed random graphs to have clusters in order to permit certain level of uh, so, uh, network flow. That's what I'm trying to Yeah, understand. There, are very, there are various ways to get uh, uh, different vari variations of the network flow. That's true. Um, every, every such variation, uh, although gives a slightly different set of properties. I was talking about the main phenomena, but there are a set of properties that, that differ in different ways that you change these networks. What I try to do is to change the network to include um, structures that are present in the the brains that we see, which are common and to understand their properties. It's true that if what you want is high correlations, there are few ways to get there, but each way would uh, create actually different properties of the activity. If you look at um, variances or um, times of, of silence or up and down activities and so, like, you can ask for higher correlations, but then with every different perturbation you do, you get uh, uh, other properties to, to vary in a different way. Um, all right. So, okay, this is becoming more challenging, but I will give it a try. Uh, okay, so, but this is great because I hate talking to myself. Uh, uh, so clusters are uh, in a sense, uh, a particular example of the previous case, uh, but very specific and therefore um, and also very common in the brain, like I said, and therefore was an interest of us to study this particular case. Again, you have subgroups, but these subgroups in this uh, case are very highly correlated in the activity. So this is actually a real study where they look at uh, neurons' um, uh, uh, sensitivity to, I think, gradings, if I, if I remember correctly. But uh, the main point for us is that uh, they respond, uh, subgroups of them respond in a similar way and they are strongly connected within them. So they're not just different types with different properties of connection, but specifically every set of group, sub, subgroup is strongly connected within. And so when you draw the connectivity matrix and you organize the neurons by their groups, you get this uh, highlight kind of blocks, but on the diagonals because that's where they're strongly connected. And in this study, in order to understand them, what we did, and that was the whole trick of the whole thing, was actually to reduce the network to uh, be represented by clusters. So now the building blocks of the network are not single neurons, but rather the clusters themselves. And so I get, again, um, very nicely, instead of having you know hundreds of thousands, I get a reduced matrix, and this reduced matrix is a matrix of clusters. Uh, what we do in the dynamics uh, to kind of count for that particular phenomena is to add what we call a self connectivity part. So every cluster is driven by itself, but also by its own activity impacting it, which is to count for all the connections within the uh, cluster that I kind of threw aside. And um, 
again, there's the network. This is now network of clusters impacting that cluster. What we do, and uh, to kind of keep your mind uh, um, not worrying, is that we do have now, and this is new, you can check it on the bioarchive well yesterday, a full uh, biophysical <laughs> spiking model of the full network showing that the results, the analysis that I'm going to show you for the reduced network actually holds for the full big picture, right? So the, the reduction in this case uh, was uh, justified. And the reason why it's important to do this is because we gain an understanding, right? So this will give us um, the phenomena. We know that the phenomena we see is correct, but having this reduced model would in the next five minutes also give us the mechanism understanding, mechanistic understanding of, of uh, what's happening. All right, so if we have clusters and they're all of the same size, which is non-biological, that's okay. It's already interesting because what these clusters do is they uh, tend to switch the activity from being chaotic and ongoing and not very interesting to have this bimodality. So every cluster by itself, if you think about strong cluster, I uh, would like to be either silent or very active. And that's the intuition for you. And so if a cluster is very strong, an input, uh, a small input would have trouble getting it out of it, whatever stable state that it is. There are plenty of neurons, they're strongly connected. They're all relatively silent. You know, it takes much to get them uh, drive, get them going. But if they're very, very active, it takes much to get them, you know, lots of inhibition to get them silenced. So what strong clusters do in a network is to um, having uh, one of uh, two states is a very active or relatively silent. And uh, eventually the whole network uh, settle into a fixed point where every cluster choose one of the possibilities. We clustering don't do much. They're close to this random network that we started with, but the whole network is the same. Um, and they're, they, they, are, they, they do add some biomodality, but it's not very strong. So that's the case. That was a study a while ago. Um, and then I actually had a, de um, a debate over Lucas still only lunch. We have uh, debated uh, whether we can use this clustering to generate uh, multi time scales in the network. And, well, we debated how to generate multi time scales in the network, and I suggested clusters, and he still owe me lunch for that. And so uh, we show that instead of taking one size of clusters, we take multiple different sizes of clustering. And in this example, there are two of them. And every set of such cluster would have its own time scale of activity. So remember that this strong cluster, they switch between being very, very, very uh, silent and being very active. Uh, and there is a typical time that it takes them to switch, right? Because again, the network, of all cluster, all clusters are the same. The whole network that every cluster you see is exactly the same. You see the same clustering around it. Uh, but once the network uh, is comprised of two sets of cluster, every set of cluster has its own time scale of how long it spends in each one of these two states. And um, what you can do is you can tweak the size of the clusters. Uh, some are very weak and some are very strong. And the time scale of activity of each set of cluster would uh, grow exponentially large. And this was actually very interesting because it's very difficult to generate this exponential growth by changing uh, single neurons, membrane constants, or so on. It will grow linearly. And here it grows exponentially, and these neurons are part of clusters. Um, and that's what's given them the ability to have such different time scales of activity. Again, because in these clusters, there are neurons, right? Uh, and so, uh, and, and also uh, the importance of having two sides of cluster is, the, is that the weak clustering, just like the neurogenesis, they keep the network active. So the big ones, the heavy ones, they wanna settle into a fixed point. They wanna be either silent or active, but the small ones keep nagging them. And so the network keeps being active because of the small ones keep nagging them. And so in the extreme case where you have just one huge cluster, and, and I guess this is more for the analytical understanding. Um, uh, this, this one huge cluster would be in one of these uh, two possible states, uh, which has to do with its size, but um, we calculate the time that is spent in each state. I think for this talk, it's a bit less interesting. 
Uh, but um, if we take a network that is comprised of many cluster sizes, then we get a network that includes within its natural uh, internal activity, multiple time scales. And that's where the, the spatial properties of the network of where the connectivity is, is strong is turned into a timing uh, mechanism, uh, uh, timing properties of the network. The network will be slow. The neurons will be slowly changing their activity where they are strongly connected within. And they'll be very fast to change their activity where they are weakly connected um, uh, within, because then every small input would change their activity uh, vastly. So that was the promise in the abstract. So I, I feel that promise. Um, and like I said, there's a huge distribution and it's exponential distribution. And actually, I think, I believe we we're the first one to um, explain uh, this uh, uh, highly um, um, uh, uh, diverse across several order of magnitudes uh, time constant that was recorded in this. I think uh, this is in the cortex as well, but um, uh, really this several time scales of activity to give a mechanistic, mechanistic explanation where what's important to say is that all the neurons that were recorded here are of the same type. They're just clustered. The connectivity is, is the, what, we, what we think that the connectivity among them is different. So it's not anything in the neuronal properties, the physical properties of the neurons, but rather how they are connected that give rise to such variance um, timescales of their activity. Okay. Uh, uh, so the other thing that uh, this type of, of organization of clustering uh, does is to um, filter the input because strong clusters would resonate well. Uh, I'm not sure there is a good piece. Um, Strong clusters would resonate well with uh, low frequencies, so they have a higher peak in this uh, Fourier transform analysis. But and and uh, small cluster would resonate better with um, input of high frequencies, and so they perform a special demixing, the place where they change their ability to um, filter the input uh, depend on the component of the network. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, that is the end of this story. So they, the bottom line is that the, the strong clusters, they're they are slow in their activity and they um, not just generate intrinsically uh, slow timescales, but they also uh, uh, resonate better with slow input that is coming in, whether the fast, uh, whether the small clusters, the weak clusters, they resonate better with high input, uh, high frequency input that is coming in. And so if you think about this kind of special um, uh, differentiation and, and input kind of flowing in, uh, you get in different places, different resonance of input and you can filter the input uh, to, to different places uh, according to whatever the needs are. <sighs> okay, so there were lots of uh, questions before, but I guess, yes. I was wondering what what do you think the ability is to predict the activity from uh, so like let's say you had a EM connective you know a connect home of a piece of brain you have everything everything about the connectivity can you predict the activity and if not what's missing? Well, if you tell me everything about the connectivity and you give me some, <sighs> ha, that's a very yeah, high level questions. Let's think. Uh, if you, <laughs> you're gra you you say connectivity to activity, so. <laughs> and I believe so. Um, if you, but I'm giving you principles. So I thought of a bit easier questions where you you know in this study we predict something very specific, and uh, we believe it's we believe it will be found, um, but. What he's telling me is that I have all the connectivity and um, I think, I mean, the answer is, I think eventually the answer is yes, but it's a long road. You start 
well, if we believe our rate models are a good description of the full biophysical spiking model, the answer should be yes. The, the, the problem where I'm stuck is actually where, you know, mathematically I'm bothered by the fact that these networks are chaotic. <laughs> and, um, and they have lots of inputs. Well, I've been talking mostly about their internal activity. Um, but I think what I can give you, if you can give me the full connectivity, is the right statistics. So whether I predict a particular one, you know, the immediate kind of ongoing activity, I think that will be hard, although we're slowly getting there. But I think what I can give you is the properties of the activity. So how long would they hold a spiking, a specific spiking rate versus another and so on. And which neurons will be highly active and which neurons will be relatively silent? I think, I hope the answer is yes. Uh, but, you know, I think I'm also not gonna be tested because can you give me a full... <laughs> I think we're on the same page, you know, to give a full connectivity and a full activity is equally difficult. So I think that would be, yeah, we're at the same level there. Um, Sorry, right. I have a, one technical question. Is there any specific reason you chose uh, log normal distribution for the size? No, we were just interested in long tail distribution that can be easily um, modeled. Uh, and, and we were interested in, in long tail distribution uh, because they're also common in the brain. Yeah. Well, well, I wonder, so if the distribution is, so here the distribution is skewed yeah. or smaller size, but yeah. if it's scaled to the larger size, it would affect the strongly stability of activity. Yeah. The network would stop being active at some point and would run into a fixed point. You need enough children running around to keep the you know, <laughs> grown up more uh, more relaxed uh, to, to keep. You need you need the small clusters to keep the network going. And we have in the manuscript the uh, conditions for this to happen. Uh, so yeah, you need the long tail. Well, it's common, but also you need it so uh, because there is a balance between. The different probabilities of the different sizes of clusters that you can have, so you can still have an activity and not a fixed point. Yeah, it's a generalization of the previous uh, study. All right, so now last for um, last but not least, um, I don't know if I have. Um... <laughs> okay, so uh, last but not least, and uh, for, especially for Izumi. This is the antidote of the clusters. This is a mechanism for um, actually uh, changing timing back into a uh, spatial property. And um, it's a bit different from the previous project in the sense that we actually started from a specific structure in the brain that was very interesting to us. And this was the uh, piriform olfactory cortex, which has a very particular um, uh, structure. Which is for 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 modelers, this is fantastic because you, you can do something with with it. And the uh, piriform cortex has uh, three different, uh, very distinct layers. There is a mess inside, but again, we're looking at the bigger picture. So the bigger picture is that there are three particular layers, and the first layer um, getting inputs from the bulb, and the bulb gets input from your Nose. So this is actually the third station. Um, yes, the third station in the brain that gets input of odors, of smells. Uh, that's why this is called the olfactory cortex or the piriform cortex because of its shape. And so it has three layers. Uh, the first one gets input uh, from the bulb, uh, which gets the input from the nose. And the second layer uh, has excited the neurons, and they are. Um, connected in a loop. This is the, feed, the, the feedback loop with inhibitory layer. So when we model this thing, uh, it's uh, relatively simple. Uh, and these are back to spiking neurons rather than spiking rate. So these neurons are actually spiking. 
not just rate of spikes. Um, we have the uh, pyramidal uh, neurons, the, the piriform cortex neuron, and what we care about is their activity in this particular study, um, which is, again, we, we take the connectivity, but we care about the activity in this particular case of specific group, and that's because these are the neurons that project forward. So we understand, if we understand their activity, we can see what next uh, higher order brain areas see from piriform cortex. And uh, we model this uh, input coming in uh, of the different odors, and we model the inhibition, uh, free forward inhibition between the input and the main uh, bunch of cells here, the pyramidal cells. And this is a feedback inhibition uh, between these cells and, and basically back to them. So they don't get any, any external input. And the question uh, was this, uh, in the piriform cortex, we know, in the olfactory cortex, we know that there's a representation of odors by which neuron is um, active. And we know that because this has been recorded, right? So people have changed the, the uh, strength of odor presented and they saw that the same cells in the piriform cortex are still active and they took a different odor and they said, and they saw that a different set of cells in the, of neurons in the piriform cortex are active, right? So we know that in the, in the piriform cortex, in the olfactory cortex, uh, it's the set of neurons that represents the odor. But um, in the input to the piriform cortex, which is coming from the olfactory bulb, it turns out that what's interesting, mostly there are other information, but what's interesting mostly in the timing of which bulb is uh, active. And so when odor is represented, and these are spikes of particular um, glomer glomeruli in the bulb, the order of which uh, glomerulus in the bulb, which, which kind of small area within the bulb is, uh, is active, this is what important, the question when. Eventually they all saturate and they all spike, or at least a huge amount of them. But the question is when they're, they're active once you smell an odor. So there is a connectivity here that allow this timing representation, right? It's exactly the opposite of the clustering case. The timing representation to be switched into a pattern representation of ensembles of neuron active. And the question is how this is happening. And this is why we built the model. Uh, but just to kind of give you the, um, um, convince you probably that the, the input is, what does it mean that the, the input is, is, a, is by time? If we have two different orders presented, then uh, the timing of which, uh, when each uh, glomerulus in the bulb is active, is different between these uh, two uh, orders. And they can be same uh, glomeruli active, but they start at different time. And what's more important is that if more smell is coming in, so the this order strength is bigger, um, all this, uh, sorry, all, all the, all the activity uh, that was um, previously in, in the less strength, strong order pr uh, present remain, but it starts earlier. So basically changing the magnitude of an order, uh, change the um, shift, the temporal activity in glomeruli, in glomeruli to start early, but it keeps the order of timing. That's why the timing is important. So from this representing cheese and these three particular glomeruli active, if you present a lot of cheese and it stinks, uh, many glomer glomeruli will be active but the three first one would remain the three first one that were active for the little bit of cheese. That's why timing is the representation here. Um, whatever comes first. That's where the, the joke of the, I, you, you can remember that if I tell you the joke where two people went to see a horse racing and the other one person asked the other, uh, how does it work? And he, he explains, you know, all the horse, horse, horse are racing and uh, whoever comes first is the winner. And after a while, the other person answering, um, okay, I thought about it and I understand why the first horse that is finishing 
is racing, but why do all the others? So <laughs> this is exactly how the, the olfactory system works. It's the who gets there first. It's representing the odor. Okay, and so in the piriform cortex, like I said, there's a representation of which neurons are active and it doesn't, uh, we do not know whether it's important when. And it actually is an ongoing question, but um, how this happens? Well, we've built the model and so we can record the spike from the models. And so in a model, we can really see everything that goes on. We have an automatic recording of all the neurons in the model, which you don't have in the reality. And therefore we can present, actually, <laughs> when you come to print them in a presentation, you have to give up some of them. So <laughs> you go back to have a, a partial representation, just in fact, we cannot uh, graph them all. But the input, like I said, is by timing. So this is a particular order of Gs, and you have this very initial um, glomeruli active in the bulb, and there being the input to the olfactory cortex. And what happens in the olfactory cortex well, the feed for neurons, I have to say, they don't do much on a regular basis um, unless the odor is very strong and then they just moderate the, the, the strengths coming in. Um, but they do it across the whole uh, sniff, right? So the, as the odor coming in, they, they kind of silence if there's too much input. Uh, next, there are the pyramidal cells, the main neurons in the piriform, and they're responding to the odor starting to coming in. So the first input that comes in, remember the first input represent the odor, they respond to it. Because we have this um, uh, feedback inhibition, the, the, these interneurons, this feedback uh, inhibitor interneurons, they silence the activity of the main cells in the piriform once they start being active. So what they do, is actually prohibits other input from coming in. So if every odor is represented by the timing of the input and the initial input is important, what this feedback inhibition is doing is to not allow further input to come in. And then it doesn't matter what, you know, how the odor is strong and all the other glomeruli that are being active just because there's so many molecules with the nose coming in, it just silenced them, All right, so, this uh, particular structure of this of this feedback loop, um, is, uh, just, just because I have a summary of this, yeah. So this particular structure of this um, of this feedback loop is what suppresses the continuous input that is confusing in a sense the system. Um, now, if this is for one order. Uh, because we're currently working uh, on expanding this model and extending further, of course, that it's not that the other horses were running for nothing, right? They've tried to get there and they have an information. And so um, the other input that is coming in is silence relatively, but not completely. And it has an information about other parts of the order, but they are secondary in their... Um, important, let's put it this way. And they're important for feedback and they're important for other parts of odors when they're mixtures and so on and so on. So on. But it's the general um, uh, structure that allows this switching from timing to um, uh, spatial representation. And actually, I know that these days, uh, this model is being um, also used for other part of the cortex, right? So you can think about this circuit as a very gen, uh, in a very general idea, right? You have a connectivity of feed full forward excitatory and feedback, and the feedback is responding for uh, silencing further input that is less important than the initial kind of information that comes in. Um, so this is what we learned from this one. And I think uh, given the time, uh, many of these observations have, have been confirmed, which was very nice of this particular, but I will not go through it. I just wanna thank you very much for coming and for listening. Uh, to this, uh, I have to say, quite ambitious uh, uh, subject covering talk. Okay, thank you very much, Mayor. Okay, further questions? Yeah, guys, on. Uh, I have a question about the last point. So, how the timing is related to the timing of uh, 
p e r c e p t i o n or cognition. A timing related to what? So in the 50 millisecond, uh, initial 50 millisecond, other orders cannot come in. Yeah. But uh, does it mean that the cognition or perception of order occurs within that timing or? So what it does is to uh, decrease significantly correlations between orders because um, different orders would initiate different uh, sensory, different subsets of sensory neurons at the very beginning, right? So they're strong, um, uh, they're strongly yeah, yeah. connected. I understand well. the mechanism, but uh, I wonder how this mechanism is actually related to animals' perception of all order. Yeah, so what it does is to, to decorrelate, right? The, the neurons that are responding. So if, if you think about the whole time of a sniff, uh, very initial um, uh, um, molecules binding is happening to, to um, molecules that are bedding, better binding with um, receptor neurons. And they kind of start right the activity, which goes all the way into the piriform through the bulb, and um, the, this, this account for this very initial activity decorrelates uh, um, their, their representation because it does not allow molecules that are less, um, that not as, as well bind uh, to, um, to receptor neurons to impact the activity down the road. So if you have two different orders, impacting two different initial sets of receptor neurons, then down the stream, this is what would come. This is what would activate the neurons. So you get a very spread activity in the olfactory, in the piriform cortex. Um, and it's, if, if, you, if you would account for the binding that goes, um, keeps, keeps happening in our nose, it would activate more and more uh, common, I would say, glomeruli and therefore neurons that would eventually be active in the piriform cortex would be more and more and more overlapping. They would be more active by the same initial neurons uh, downstream or up, up the stream, I know. Yeah, uh, initially. So it decorrelates uh, different odors. The question is, what do you do uh, when you have odors that are quite similar to each other, to each other and they're and then we come in and said, well, there are attention mechanisms and feedbacks, and they actually have to connect the piriform back to the olfactory. But for this, you have to uh, wait for next year. <laughs> Other questions? So, is there any question from the Zoom uh, participant? Nobody? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we had a lot of questions during your talk. Okay, thank you very much for your nice presentation and covering all these topics. Thank you very much.